praise the Lord. A new altar. And we're going to be taking a look at things that are fundamental to our faith and our work with the Lord. And one of such is the altar. I'll take a reading from Genesis 35 verse 1. And I'll be reading from the Living Bible. Move on to Bethel now and settle there, God said to Jacob, and build an altar to worship me, the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Bethel by interpretation means the house of God. So here we see God saying to Jacob, go to my house and there build an altar unto me. What is it about the altar that God so took particular interest in it? He could have just said to Jacob, go to Bethel and there worship me. But God said to him, go to Bethel, build an altar unto me and then worship. So why are we talking about altars? We are in Christ. We are New Testament believers. But the question is, the concept of altar, is it really an Old Testament thing? What is the definition of the Old Testament? Did the Old Testament start in Genesis chapter 1? The answer is no. Because every time we talk about the Old Testament, our minds go back to Genesis chapter 1. And then we start talking about the Old Testament from Genesis chapter 1. Christ came to Abraham and offered him the same communion that he offered his disciples that heralded the coming, I mean the establishment of the New Testament. Genesis 14 from verse 17. Let me read from the message translation. It says, After Abraham returned from defeating Kedolauma and his allied kings, the king of Sodom came and to greet him in the valley of Shaveh, the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and what? I can't hear. Brought out what? Bread and wine. He says he was priest of the high God and blessed him. And he says, blessed be Abraham by the high God, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be the high God who handed your enemies over to you. Abraham gave him a tenth of all he recovered. Plunder. Who do you give your tithes to? You give your tithes to, to God. So we see that tithing is not an Old Testament practice. Because Tithe was first given before the Old Testament came into effect. Is somebody hearing me tonight? So when next someone says to you that tithing is an Old Testament practice, tell them it is not. Because the man that first gave tithe did not live under the Old Testament. So somebody will now ask, so under which testament did he live? He lived the New Testament before the Old Testament started. Because Christ is the testator of the New Testament. And the Bible says that Christ has died before the foundation of the earth. The concept of the altar is not an Old Testament thing. It's not a New Testament thing. It's a godly thing. Now the Hebrew word translated as altar is mishbihar. And it means a place of slaughter. So the altar is a place of slaughter. That's a place where animals are slaughtered. And in the traditional way, you don't talk about altars without thinking about what to slaughter on the altar. So the altar is a place of sacrifice. The altar is a place of devotion. The altar is a place of commitment. The altar is a place of surrender. And the first thing we slaughter at the altar 
is ourselves. You are the first sacrifice that must be slaughtered at the altar. At the altar, you slaughter your will. At the altar, you slaughter your desires. At the altar, you slaughter your business, you slaughter your career, you slaughter your family, you slaughter your ministry, you slaughter everything that belongs to you. The meaning of that is you surrender it all to God. Anyone who is not ready to commit the whole of his life to an altar has no business around that altar. So we're talking about a new altar. What we are saying simply tonight is you need to come to that point if you want to raise a new altar unto the Lord where you say to God, everything about my life I lay down on your altar. That may be a tough thing to do. But the truth is, except and until you do that, you can't profit from the altar. The altar, as we know, is a place where the supernatural meets with the natural. It's a place where divinity meets with humanity. It's a point of exchange. It's a place of communion. A place of communication. It's a place of influence. We come to the altar to be influenced by the power that is on the altar, by the God that is on the altar. There's an altar behind every success. There's an altar behind every breakthrough. Somebody must have committed to an altar, to a place of divine presence, either in the positive or in the negative. There is no one that will make it extraordinarily that will not have an altar speaking for him. Nobody. So whether it is in the positive or in the negative, every activity that goes on under the heavens responds to an altar. Every activity responds to an altar. So the altar is not an African thing, black thing. No, 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 no. It's a human thing. Everywhere. Altars have a voice. There's no altar without a voice. And that voice speaks for those who are committed to it. And speaks against those who fight them. When you come to the altar and you kneel at the altar, and you present an issue on the altar, and you offer your sacrifice unto God, a voice goes out. That voice speaks for you, and that voice speaks against anything that is working against you. You come to church, and then God speaks a word to you. And you say, oh, I received, that's my word. But you walk out of the church without raising an altar for God. The necessary thing to do when God speaks to you, when you believe you've received an encounter from the Lord, is to run to the place of his altar and put a sacrifice on it. When you do that, you put a seal upon the word of God. You are saying to God, God, I receive what you have said and I offer this as a sacrifice of appreciation unto you. What you have done is you have pushed God to one corner. That God will ensure that what he says come to pass. Because he has received the thank you sacrifice. But many of us, we don't do that. You just receive it, you wave your hands from wherever you are seated, and then you go. That's why many promises remain unfulfilled in our lives. Many promises. Even if you are at home, and then God reveals himself to you, when next you have the opportunity to come to the place of his altar, put a sacrifice on the altar concerning that encounter. If you have an altar at home where you... Let me also say this. You know, some of us, we have altars at home. I don't have anything against it, all right? But I just hope that that altar is alive. You know why? Because what activates the altar is sacrifice. Some of us will have a place, one corner at home, that we have consecrated as our altar. 
But you go there to pray to worship, you don't drop offering. That altar is not alive. Somebody will ask, so if I, if I start dropping offering in my own house, what do I do? Because the altar you have at home is just an extension of the altar of God. So when next you are coming to the house of God, to Bethel, you come with the offerings and then you drop it on the altar there. So maybe now you know the reason you have prayed some prayers on that altar at home and it didn't work. Because the altar is not alive. Every time God blessed Abraham, he returned to the altar of sacrifice. You find an example in Genesis 13 verse 1 to 4. Genesis 13 verse 1 to 4. Some of us, we keep money for God. Maybe you, you take offering at home and all of that, and you spend the money. <laughs> you spend it, or you borrow it. You say, God, I will give it back to you. It's never done on the altar. Never done. Nobody places a sacrifice on the altar and goes back to meet the herbalist. He say, oh, God, borrow me the goat. I'll bring it back tomorrow. It's never done. You come to the altar to ask. The moment God answers you, nobody sees your brake light again. That's why many of our breakthroughs are not sustained. Because we always forget the place of our encounter with God. Some of us don't even pay our tithes. Now, let me say this to you. That your tithe is not even a sacrifice. Hello? Your tithe is not what? It's not a sacrifice. No, 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 no. Your tithe is a requirement. It's a debt you owe. You owe God your tithe. That's why whether you pay it voluntarily or not, God will take his tithe. It belongs to him. And like I've said here, it's in your best interest to give it to God willfully. Because if God should come to collect, he will collect more than 10%. I mean, you, you mean God will walk all the way, come all the way, and then he won't charge you penalties? Even in our earthly laws, they charge you penalty when you default. That's the normal thing. So give it to God. Now what I'm trying to say is, your tithe is not a sacrifice on the altar. So if you have been bringing your tithe, say, God, I have brought my sacrifice. It's not sacrifice. He is not sacrifice. He is a debt you owe God. Your offerings should be bigger than your tithe. Because that is the real sacrifice. If your tithe in a month is 1,000 naira, the summation of your offerings for that month should exceed that. That's what qualifies it as sacrifice. Sacrifices are a proof of our relationship with God. And the strength of your relationship is what determines the potency of your altar. Please write that down and put it in your head. Your offerings reflect your relationship with God. And the strength of that offering, which reveals also the strength of your relationship with God determines how potent your altar will be. Weak relationship, weak altar. Strong relationship, strong altar. And that explains why the altar in the church delivers to members of the church differently. Differently. The same God, the same altar, we get answers differently. Somebody may have to come seven times before God will answer one prayer. Another person will come one time, he won't even spend seven minutes, God has answered ten prayers. Why? The strength of relationship. So you must have a personal connection with this altar. 
It's not just about, oh, the altar in the church. No, until it becomes my altar. Some people will say to you, I have my altar where I go to pray. And they ask them, where is that altar? They say the altar in church. How has the altar in church become their own altar? Because of a personal attachment to that altar. Until you have a personal attachment to the altar in the house of God, it might not deliver to you your expectations. So how do you have this personal encounter? A personal commitment, connection with it. Number one, by having the right perception of the altar. When you look at the altar from where you are seated, what do you see? If all you see is the red carpet and the wooden floor and the monitors that are here and the pulpit, you don't see beyond that. You won't get beyond that. You must have the right perception to know that this is not just a structure that is constructed. This is a revered place where the presence of God is. Number two, your persuasion. You must be fully persuaded that God is in this place. If you don't have that persuasion, in fact, there's no point for you to even come to the church. There's no need for you coming to pray at the altar. Because it's just a waste of time. You must be fully persuaded about the reality of encounters at the altar. Number three, you must prepare yourself. Preparation. Preparation. When Elijah was to call down the presence of God, the fire of God, he prepared. He prepared. When you are coming into the house of God, prepare for the altar. Prepare for the altar. People that worship idols, before they step out of their homes, they prepare for the altar that they're going. They prepare. They will make sure that everything is complete. The one that must be seven will be seven. The one that must be white must be white. The one that must be black must be black. They ensure that everything is said before they go. They won't get to the place and they say, bring Kolano. They say, ah, Kolano, we didn't bring Kolano too. Everything will be complete. Preparation. And of course, the last one is participation. Participation. Where you stand, they are singing, praising God, you are busy doing other things. That's when you remember that you want to send a message to somebody. You are not participating. When it is time for the altar to answer people, the altar will answer you. It won't answer you because you have not participated. When they say, everybody, lift up your hands and wave to the Lord, you drop your own hand. And then the pastor says, I stand as God's servant on this altar to pray for you. And I say, Amen. That Amen will not reach here. You know why? You have not participated. Participation. We're talking about spiritual things. You can't circumvent them. You can't. You will raise an altar unto God for something that is important to you. I found out in the scriptures that some altars were raised once and for all. They just raised the altar and they never went back to the altar. But the altar speaks on for life. An example was the altar that Noah raised. It was just once he did it. But that altar still speaks till today. That's why you still see the rainbow. Because the altar speaks. Raise an altar today that will speak on for the rest of your life. They never thought that Anna could give birth. But she went to the altar. And the altar responded. She didn't just give birth to one, not two, not three, not four. The altar responded. 
You see, the sacrifice you put on the altar can be the exchange for your life in the market of death. <laughs> 